wasn't built in a day. And today, we're going to talk about why it wasn't. It actually started as a small little city on the banks of the Tiber River, without any kind of king, without any real leadership. But today, we're going to show you how it went from a small little city with no identity to becoming a world superpower. Roll film! After its founding, Rome became a leading city under the rule of the Etruscans. But in 509 BC, Latin cities kicked out the Etruscan king, and others joined in an alliance against them. Rome then took over the Latin cities as their leader, and eventually expanded northwards by defeating the Etruscans. Rome then began to expand south, threatening the Greek colonies that lived on the southern Italian peninsula. What are you doing on the land? The Greek colonies called on Pyrrhus to fight back against the Roman advance. He was a relative of Alexander the Great, obviously the best conqueror ever, and he used war elephants as tanks in battle. He defeated Rome twice, but the second victory cost him very badly. It was very bad, man. This coined the term Pyrrhic victory, or a victory where the costs of winning the battle outweigh the actual advantages of winning that battle. Pyrrhus, now weakened again, heads back home to Greece. Rome now takes over southern Italy, and by 265 BC, controls the entire Italian peninsula. Now, Rome did treat her conquests fairly. They were granted citizenship, had the ability to vote and hold office, and they gave each of them a degree of local independence. They didn't require them to pay taxes or tributes, but they did require them to give troops. Now, Danny, tell us why they needed those troops. Well, as Rome expanded, they came into conflict with Carthage, another power in the western world. Carthaginians were masters of the sea, and they had hired foreign mercenary forces, unlike the Romans, who were fighting for their own country. These conflicts led to wars between 264 and 146 BC, called the Punic Wars. The first Punic War was fought between 264 and 241 BC. It was fought over control of the island of Sicily. Rome feared that Carthage would use the island as a base for invasion, and Carthage feared the same. The big thing standing in the way of the Romans was Carthage's incredibly amazing navy. He's like the best in the world! In order to try to break the power of their navy, the Romans captured a Carthaginian warship, and they tried to reverse engineer its design and build ships for Rome, but it didn't really work out. The Roman sailor wasn't quite as experienced enough in sailing to uh, make it work with the Carthaginians' design. What's this button do? And as a result, they had to take a different tactic. But they actually did land a stroke of genius when they figured out that they could use their already vastly superior soldiers as fighters on the sea. Because, you see, back in those days, the naval battles consisted of basically the ships just ramming into each other. Sir, I believe you have just bumped into me. And Rome decided, since their soldiers were so much better, that they could just throw a plank down in between the two ships and just hop over and go crazy, kill everybody. <laughs> and that's really kind of what they did. They crippled Carthage in the process and ended up defeating Carthage despite some setbacks here and there. Carthage asked for peace in 241 BC. And that ended the First Punic War. And that leaves you with our score of Rome 1, Carthage 0. Over a period of about 20 years, Carthage recovered from her losses and tried to re-extend her dominion back where it had used to be. Carthage attacked a Roman ally in Spain, and Rome tried to respond by dividing Carthage's forces, who are now half in Europe and half in Africa. They would have succeeded too. That is, if it hadn't been for young Carthaginian commander, Hannibal. He was a brilliant military strategist, and he realized his only hope was to invade Italy itself. <laughs> he set out from Spain with cavalry, elephants, and some 40,000 men. He marched his army into the harsh snowy Alps and threw them into northern Italy. The weather, mountain dangers, and tribal attacks cut his army in half. Nevertheless, his army surprised Rome and had many victories in Italy, despite being outnumbered. In the spring of 216 BC, at Cannae, 
the Roman legion confronted Hannibal's army with an advantage of two to one. Hannibal devised a plan to have his army's line bulge out in the center. The Roman legions then surged forward into Hannibal's line. As far as the Romans are concerned, their plan is working perfectly. They have a chance at the victory, no matter how clumsy it may be, simply because they outnumber them. The Romans are playing straight into Hannibal's hands. His plan is working. Hannibal springs his trap. His deadly African mercenaries cut into the undefended flanks of the Roman army. Hannibal's cavalry returns to complete the encirclement of the Roman infantry. The Romans are surrounded. Hannibal's army then nearly wipes out the Roman forces. Meanwhile, Rome tried to besiege the city of Syracuse, which was on the island of Sicily. But they met with some really rather strange war machines. Dude, I've never seen that before. As the Romans sailed into the harbor, they were surprised to find that they were bombarded with all sorts of missiles. But for real, Syracuse had figured out some crazy catapults. They were being able to shoot stones of over 500 pounds. Dude, I can pick that up with my bare hands! They also had cranes on the banks of their city where they could just pick up the Roman ships and smash them into the rocks on the side. It was insane. This is also the source of the legend of Archimedes' death ray. Oh. Archimedes was a famous mathematician that had lived in Syracuse. Like a total nerd. And legend has it that he figured out how to use some seriously humongous mirrors and focus the sun's rays onto the Roman ships and catch them on fire. But anyways, by 212 BC, the Romans captured it anyways because Syracuse wasn't really good at anything other than tricks. A young Roman commander rose up whose name was Scipio. He first defeated some enemies in Spain, then instead of going home to Rome, he went directly to Carthage to attack it. Hannibal was ordered back to defend, but Scipio defeated him and captured the city of Carthage. At the Battle of Zama in 202 BC, they ended the Second Punic War, with Carthage surrendering, giving up all their territory outside of North Africa, cutting down navy to ten ships, and paying Rome money for war damages. Fifty years later, Rome became worried about Carthage returning to power. Roman Senator Cato said, Carthage must be destroyed. When Carthage broke one of the pieces of their treaty, Rome demanded that they move ten miles inland, which was impossible for them. They refused and were no match for the Romans. Carthage was completely wiped out and sold into slavery. Rome was now the master of the West Mediterranean. Rome's eastern rivals were Macedonia, Syria, and Egypt, and they were all struggling, struggling with another for power. Since Macedonia had sided with Carthage, Rome targeted them first and sent troops to attack them. Macedonia was weakened, and Syria invaded them, crossing the Hellespont. Rome answered the challenge by soundly defeating the Syrian army. Egypt thought it was best to make an alliance with Rome. Rome was now master of the East and West Mediterranean. Rome first allowed Eastern conquest fell government, like on the Italian peninsula, but it didn't work so well. After uprisings and rivalries, they organized them into provinces and appointed governors to rule over them, and charged a tribute in order for order and protection. Rome was now on its way to ruling the entire world!